Good afternoon and welcome to today's Texas Public Policy Foundation live stream, Border War, How a More Porous Border Will Endanger Americans. Oliver, manager of TPPF's Right on Immigration campaign, thanks for joining us. It's a fact that the new administration in Washington is in the process of opening up our country to receive hundreds of thousands of new asylum seekers and refugees. What could go wrong? Let's talk about it with our featured guest today, who is the author of the number one book on immigration right now on Amazon. Todd Bensman is the author of America's Covert Border War. He's also a senior fellow at the Center for Immigration Studies. And for nine years, he previously led counterterrorism intelligence for our Texas Department of Public Safety. We are also joined today by Kyle Schidler. Kyle is at the direct, he's director of Homeland Security at the Center for Security Policy. And he's an expert on radical Islamist groups in the United States. And finally, we're also joined uh, by my colleague, senior fellow in border security, Josh Jones. Josh previously served in the United States Department of Justice for 18 years as a federal prosecutor where he was on the front lines of the fight against transnational criminal organizations in North, Central, and South America. Josh most recently served on the U.S. Attorney General's Joint Task Force Vulcan created to eliminate the threat of MS-13 here in the United States. So Kyle, before we go to Todd, let's kick this off with you. And I'm gonna be the devil's advocate. What do you say to those who would push back on all this and say, you guys are fear-mongering about the Islamist threat to the United States? I mean, didn't we already destroy the caliphate and didn't we already get this under control? If I hear our own government right, uh, Islamists aren't even considered the biggest domestic terror threat anymore. Yeah, I mean, this has been a point that they have argued on for some period of time, going well back to the 2016 election. Then, of course, the migrant crisis in Europe and the caravan crisis in the United States. They wanted to say, well, there's simply no way that Islamic terrorists are going to, to use these streams to, to infiltrate uh, into the country and even... Uh, then, you know, the real threat is uh, white supremacist groups or neo-Nazi groups here in the United States. It's not jihadists. And the way they attempt to make that argument is to claim that uh, domestic terrorists like white supremacists kill more people than jihadists do. Well, this is irrelevant for two reasons. One, because these numbers change all the time. A single incident can change these numbers for an entire year. Uh, we saw that in the, in the case of the Pulse uh, nightclub killings. Uh, which, which skyrocketed uh, jihadist attacks back to the top for, for a period of time. And of course, the, the, other, the other small secret is that they don't count uh, terrorist attacks accurately. Uh, they often uh, mislabel uh, certain incidents as white supremacist incidents, and they ignore other incidents which were likely jihadist attacks. So it's not, it's not a fair or reasonable way to judge uh, what the threat actually is. Uh, something like the Paris massacre which killed hundreds of people, was conducted by only nine individuals, uh, refugees who had fled under orders from ISIS to conduct that attack. So incidents like that can change the game immediately. International terrorism, foreign terrorism is simply a different specter and different type and scale of threat than domestic threats are, and we need to treat it differently. So Todd, the book is America's a covert border war and about this threat of jihad in the United States. Let's tie it to, to this massive change by the new administration here in Washington to not double, not triple, not quadruple, but even more than five times increase the number of refugees we're gonna receive in the United States. Um, and not only that, but the, the number of asylum seekers by hundreds of thousands of more people. So in your book, you talked about what happened in Europe and Germany when, when Angela Merkel and other leaders made a very similar you know, decision to open the gates to refugees and asylum seekers and what happened after that. Now, there are obvious differences in, in terms of where most of the people were coming from. So how comparable is that really to the situation where we're in the process of facing in the US with hundreds of thousands or more refugees and asylum seekers? Well, I think the main takeaway there from the European experience is uh, not necessarily the scale of uh, attacks and infiltrations over the European borders. It's really the fact that, that border management systems collapsed under the weight of 
just the numerical numbers of people that were coming into the European theater. Uh, they just were not able to uh, cope with the asylum backlogs and with vetting and with really anything else. They uh, had a really hard time controlling for that. And I think that the main lesson that could be extrapolated from the European uh, circumstance where you had uh, ISIS operatives, terrorists uh, take advantage and exploit that flow and move in over the borders in really very significant numbers and conduct attacks one after another after another. It wasn't just Paris and Brussels. Uh, there are attacks continuing five years later to the present day. Uh, when you have that happening at the southern border and you also have uh, migration from the same countries, albeit smaller numbers, but nevertheless, you know, thousands in the thousands of uh, migrants coming from the same countries, Afghanistan, Yemen, Sudan, Iraq, Iran, uh, all of those places over the southern border without uh, uh, systems that are capable of uh, doing their, their jobs normally, then the risk obviously goes up. There's a higher threat, a higher risk. Uh, and, and I think that if uh, people don't have their eye on the ball about this now in the United States, then you are basically European leaders in 2014 and 2015. And there's no reason to be European leaders uh, with blinders on in 2014 and 2015. Um, I'd also mention that there's an ideology about uh, migrants and migration on the political liberal side of uh, spectrums in Europe as well as in the United States that allowed for this, that facilitated this kind of mass migration. Uh, Angela Merkel was the, only the first one who said, let them all in, we're not the Nazis anymore. Uh, and, and then following that was a lot of virtue uh, policy uh, implementation by all the other leaders. And pretty soon you had a lot of migration. Well, I hear from the Biden people um, before the election and now a lot of the very same verbiage, the same terminology, the same ideology, uh, again, uh, without taking into account basic security uh, considerations. I want to tie our discussion today directly to the issue of the massive abuse of our country's asylum system. And that's basically what led to the last border crisis we had uh, just you know, less than two years ago. Now asylum abuse is rearing its head again as the policies that were finally put in place in 2019 to tamp that crisis down are being systematically undone by the new administration in Washington. So we know hundreds of thousands of people from Central America have taken advantage of our asylum system to get into the US. How about people from the Middle East and other parts of the world? Um, Todd, in your book, you say, our asylum system is the very definition of a national security danger. Explain that. Okay, our, the US asylum system is very similar to the asylum systems of Western Europe. And there are really kind of two issues here. One is that internally, the systems are uh, not structured to properly vet to cast the uh, right level of shadow of a doubt on claims that are made by incoming migrants. Uh, in fact, it's, it's structured in a way that enables fraud and abuse, that uh, perpetuates fraud and abuse. So that, uh, to just give you an example, uh, you know, somebody might come in, uh, you know, we just had 11 Iranians cross the Arizona border it made news, CBP put a press release out about that one. Usually they don't. Uh, but uh, undoubtedly, those Iranian migrants claimed asylum at the border. They'll have a story, a credible fear uh, story to get past the initial screening. Well, that initial screening is incredibly weak. It's like a 30-minute phone interview. And they take the information and they check the yes box and you, you're in. Uh, and not only are you in, but you're in with a backlog that's three, four, five years. This is what happened in Europe is people would come in, they'd make these spurious claims about asylum, and then they're in. 
and then they go plot attacks and uh, you know there's running gun battles in the streets and funeral processions and all that. Um, that is the situation in place that you don't have uh, fraud detection. Uh, there's no viable, uh, I dedicate a whole chapter in the book about how uh, there, there is an absence of fraud detection, investigation, and most importantly, prosecution at the U.S. attorney's offices. And maybe um, our other guests can talk about that. But um, U.S. attorney's offices uh, do not, by and large, prosecute asylum fraud unless it's a multiple state big sort of racket, but that's not the way jihadists operate. Uh, they come in or just Islamic uh, people from, from Muslim majority countries, they're coached in exactly what to say to hit the credible fear bar to get in. Their smugglers are almost as expert at coaching how to get through an asylum officer interview as like the best immigration lawyers in the United States. They know exactly what to say, what's in vogue, what's not in vogue. And we've seen time and again, uh, migrants from those countries, including jihadists, uh, I, can, I can name several who uh, were only caught after they, they got in and uh, were well on their way uh, to achieving asylum in the United States. And some of them actually did and got prosecuted for terrorism. It's a big problem. Our vetting systems for asylum seekers differ. I mean, talk about that. There's obviously more vetting for refugees going through the UN than the, the asylum seekers you're talking about. Uh, but how do, that, how do they compare to Europe's? Uh, similar? Well, in times of crisis, when you have, you know, 100,000 Central Americans crossing all day long, they can't even keep up with giving them notices to appear and getting them to the Greyhound bus station, let alone doing any kind of vetting. And uh, there's a big difference between those who are in Syria who apply for uh, refugee status, say with the UNHCR, United Nations. Uh, there is some kind of vetting. They meet, they have interviews, they are some level of vetting, although it's not perfect. But when people cross the, the border, very often they don't even have passports or identification. Uh, there is like you, you our, our officers have to start from literally ground zero. They have nothing to get traction on. A lot of these migrants are coming from places like Iran. We're not calling the Iranian intelligence service to ask for an intelligence share on their, their citizens. Uh, the Assad government in Syria, the same thing. We're not caught, there's no way, there's no, it, it's a blank slate over there. Uh, in many of those countries, Libya, uh, same, Somalia didn't even have a government for 25 years, uh, let alone, so nobody even has birth certificates or marriage licenses or driver's licenses in Somalia. So uh, we have a lot of Somalias crossing the border including one who went up to Edmonton, Canada, crossed into California and conducted a double vehicle ramming attack carrying an ISIS flag in 2017. I want to bring in Kyle, and I, I neglected to mention Kyle's uh, also one of the authors of a 2011 book uh, called Saudi Arabia and the Global Islamic Terrorist Network. So Kyle, uh, I want you to weigh in on that. Um, some of what you've seen uh, with what Todd's been talking about um, and the vetting systems and the, the networks, um, and, and then the return of the catch and release policies. Do they apply to people when there's an elevated risk of, of people in country, coming from countries with an elevated risk of Islamist terrorist operations? Yeah, well, I think uh, Todd makes a really great point when he says, first of all, we're dealing with countries primarily that we, uh, we know nothing about. And this is assuming we can even establish accurately what country they're coming from, because they may not tell us that uh, accurately either. Uh, we've certainly seen cases where people have tried to cross the border, uh, you know, claiming to be Venezuelan uh, with, with actually pretty decent paperwork. Uh, and then of course they were nothing of the kind. They were actually from somewhere in the Middle East uh, like Syria. Uh, so this, this question of vetting is really important. And 
uh, in a lot of cases, our officers are not uh, necessarily getting the training they deserve in terms of how to do this kind of vetting, uh, trying to figure out these details about uh, what groups are involved in certain areas, who's oppressing who, uh, where there's violence, how accurate some of these stories are, uh, what an individual's allegiances may be. Uh, these are very challenging things and they take a lot of uh, ability to understand the region and understand what's at play and what the current events are in order to do this kind of uh, vetting. And, in, and under the uh, Obama administration, in fact, a lot of our people were instructed not to ask uh, any question that might, might appear to uh, raise questions about whether you're, you're, you're interrogating their, their religious practice or something like that, even though when you're hunting for uh, jihadists, that's a relevant question. So in order to conduct quality vetting, we have to have quality information, one, which Todd mentioned, and then we have to have quality training in order to know how to ask the right questions. And that's one of the things that I'm very concerned that, that we aren't doing uh, at the level that we need to. Josh, uh, Todd in his book talks about Homeland Security investigations, and, and, and this is something I know you've covered as well. Does Homeland Security coordinate and how well are they coordinating with their counterparts in Latin America, particularly in the context of biometrics? Sure, uh, HSI, the, which is the law enforcement uh, body within Homeland Security, uh, Department of Homeland Security, has actually a, a very good uh, and robust program uh, with NAMI, which is the, uh, the, the Mexican counterpart down there. They uh, have, have a, a, a very large, extensive uh, database of, of, uh, of, of uh, H, uh, HSI the, and um, that, that, that system is, is, is shared, the, the database is shared uh, when Anami uh, has an encounter, whether it's on the Guatemalan border or, or somewhere in Mexico, uh, they, they are able to get the fingerprint, they, they can share the, the, the data, the, the identity with, with HSI. And uh, it's, it's actually a very cooperative relationship. It's, it's probably the most cooperative relationship that we have right now with the government of Mexico. You know, last week, the administration in Washington announced their new immigration enforcement policies. It's no surprise um, that, uh, and, and this has to be seen as positive, terrorists top the list as a priority for enforcement. So Todd, uh, does that give you reason for, will the Biden administration continue these policies that have kept us uh, uh, free of an a Islamist attack in the U.S.? Well, it all goes to follow through. Uh, words are great, of course. I mean, what else are they going to say? Uh, you know, we, uh, we are opposed to terrorism and we're going to do something about it. Uh, but the, the actions speak louder than. Uh, having said that, and I'm, maybe I'm a little bit uh, too skeptical about that, but um, I will say that the, the covert border war that's at the heart of my book is fundamentally nonpartisan. Uh, professional careerists in Homeland Security, people who are not you know, political appointees or connected to administrations necessarily run these programs on their own. And often um, it's free of uh, political meddling, or it has been. There's been some. I, I can get into some cases where in the Obama administration they meddled uh, quite a bit with the which country should be on the list uh, for migrants that need to be vetted harder. But um, under yeah, I like I like Kyle to talk about that too. Um, uh, okay, and under um, Obama. Uh, Secretary of DHS, uh, Jay Johnson. Uh, in the book, I, I, I feature a memorandum uh, from Jay Johnson that came out in about May 2016, where uh, clearly looking at what was happening in Europe at that time with border infiltration and proliferations and attacks everywhere all the time, uh, started thinking about special interest aliens and these kind of migrants that are this migrant flow coming over our border and to his great credit, called for a total uh, comprehensive multi-agency effort that would evaluate what programs are in place, which agencies are doing what on the covert border war. He didn't call it the covert border war, but I do. 
and uh, that they were going to put that hoist that thing up on the uh, on the uh, jacks and get under there and work on it. Uh, because those guys, even Democrats, read intelligence reporting, uh, and they see who's coming across. They saw that jihadists were coming across and getting caught. And the Jay Johnson uh, program that I detail, I think in chapter two, uh, never really went anything once the Trump administration took over, because there's obviously the conversion of personnel and things changed and it never happened. The top recommendation in my book is to bring back Jay Johnson's effort, his plan. And I interviewed Jay Johnson about this. Uh, this is just a fundamentally, not, fundamentally nonpartisan uh, issue. And I hope that the Biden administration just, uh, you know, continues in that uh, vein. Now, you did mention, I want to ask Kyle about that, under the Obama administration, uh, there, there was, and perhaps it's political correctness, right? Uh, there was um, not as clear identification of, of the threat and perhaps even by internal interest groups in the United States. Uh, wh what are your thoughts, Kyle? Yeah, I mean, that, that's where my head immediately goes to uh, when Todd talks about the very, very accurately talks about the nonpartisan nature of our investigators and, and uh, officials working this problem. The problem is uh, the issue has become exceedingly political. Um, you had, you know, under uh, the Biden campaign, he received a, a tremendous pressure from uh, lobby groups in the United States, in particular uh, Islamist lobby groups with ties to uh, radical organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood, which put a, a great deal of pressure on him to end uh, what they called the, the Trump Muslim ban, but which was, of course, uh, had to do with a list of countries which we couldn't get quality intelligence from uh, in order to make uh, visa admission uh, decisions. Uh, and so they put a great deal of pressure on him and very successfully, very quickly, as soon as he took office, uh, he put an end to, to that Trump executive order. And I think we're going to see uh, that pressure ratcheted up. Um, we saw it growing in the Obama administration and it's really reached uh, a level at this point in this country, which is very problematic. I mean, you had an you had a terror attack on an, a immigration and customs enforcement uh, facility in Tacoma, Washington, a few years ago by a domestic terrorist. That's how upset uh, some of these pressure groups have made uh, people in this country on this topic. So the idea that we're going to get a non-politicized lists of countries that we can uh, all agree. There's just no good intelligence uh, in order to vet with. Uh, it's going to be really difficult, I think, to uh, de depoliticize this issue so that professionals can make uh, can make good decisions. And and I think we have to uh, we have to push back and provide those professionals the cover that they need by saying this is a legitimate issue. Uh, you know, the American people want a secure border. They want uh, an administration that will say. Uh, keeping terrorists out of the country is a good thing. And this, if this is the best way to do it, then that's what we're going to do. And so, but I don't think we can do that uh, by depoliticizing it. We have to, uh, we have to go to where it has been politicized and push back and say, no, there are good, reasonable arguments for doing these things. Um, it's not racist to want to know who's coming into your country. These are all arguments uh, that have to be made in the public sphere. Right. Josh, I'd like to turn to you on this. Um, just a practical question on how human traffickers move people into the United States and how do the transnational criminal organizations, which you uh, prosecuted as a Justice Department attorney, how do they move drugs into the United States? Are they moved in the same way or not? Is there what's been your experience even with this part of the problem of, of special interest aliens from countries that uh, have terrorist activity? Sure. The, the, the larger transnational uh, criminal organizations or, or the drug cartels typically use tunnels. Uh, they use the land ports. Uh, at, at times, they'll use uh, open areas of the border to move large quantities of, of, of drugs across. Uh, when it comes to human traffickers, they, uh, the, the, the margins on moving a human across, uh, on being paid to move a human across the border, are nowhere near what a drug cartel makes for moving a kilo of cocaine or, or meth across the border. So the, the cartels are, are generally not going to let human traffickers use their tunnels because they'd be endangering 
the existence of, of the tunnel, the, the, the tunnels possibly could be found if someone gets to the other side, gets apprehended and then tells the US government where the tunnel is. So uh, th th there's, there is some interaction uh, on, the, on the border uh, between cartels and human trafficking organizations. Uh, human trafficking organizations in theory should be paying taxes to whichever uh, cartel owns the port that they're moving uh, the illegal, immigrant, illegal immigrants through. Uh, sometimes it happens, sometimes it, it doesn't. Uh, cartels sometimes will uh, work with human traffickers to move uh, drugs across with on, on, in, in uh, backpacks with the, uh, with, with the illegal immigrants. Uh, sometimes they'll send illegal immigrants across in, in mass in one area so that it diverts CBP from an area where they're trying to move a large quantity of drugs across. Uh, so so the, the, there is some interaction there, but I, I think uh, when it comes to a potential terrorist trying to get across the border, for them to operate in the United States the way that they have operated in the past, they need some status. Like they need to be able to, to, to settle in and, and start a life. And to do that, I think the asylum system is probably the, the, the best way of, uh, for them to get across as opposed to sneaking across where they get to the United States, but then they don't have that they don't have legal status. That they have to figure out how to sell them in the U.S. Yeah, I want to invite members of our audience to submit any questions. We're going to go to some of the best questions in our live streams that come from audience members. So that uh, would be great in our chat to, to put in a question, which we'll get to probably in the next few minutes. But I want to get to something that uh, related to Texas especially. And Todd, you worked at the state level. Our governor, Greg Abbott, just a few weeks ago at his State of the State address, he talked about how the new administration is in Washington is opening the borders, so the state is going to have to step up uh, its own border security. What, what can and should the state be doing from your point of view and your experience in, in, as a state, uh, state level official? Uh, yeah, so I uh, worked in the Intelligence Counterterrorism Division at Texas Department of Public Safety for nine years, including four of those years were uh, in support of and, and during what was called Operation Strong Safety, OSS. And it was uh, during the Obama years, uh, the last four years, uh, where it was perceived here that there was uh, not as much federal enforcement activity as, as um, at that time it was um, uh, Rick Perry, I think, and then it, it carried over to uh, Abbott. Um, and what was done was, uh, you know, DPS is a billion dollar agency uh, with a lot of resources, air, marine and land assets. And we moved them all down on the border, working very, very close partnership with Border Patrol, plugging up holes, uh, creating a presence uh, for uh, deterrence on drug trafficking, uh, especially we uh, state troopers can uh you know, catch drug traffickers and make cases, uh, state cases. Uh, but for human smuggling and the, the, um, the migrants that were coming across, uh, our people would catch them and call Border Patrol to come pick them up. So it provided this extra sort of skein of, um, uh, you know, deterrence, uh, patrol cars, squad cars. Uh, we had cigarette boats that had, uh, you know, 900 horsepower engines on the back with uh, 30 caliber machine guns uh, patrolling up and down the Rio Grande. And there's quite a lot that the Texas, a um, lot, a lot of, of uh, resources that could be brought to bear. And what I'm told is that is actually happening right now. Again, uh, there is a new operation. DPS is on their way down there. And uh, several of the sectors where catch and release is being practiced uh, and not just catch and release, but there's a lot of uh, reports of uh, gotaways. They're just sort of crashing the border. They don't want to get caught. They want to just kind of get past border patrol and get into the interior. There are reasons for that. And, uh, you know, I think DPS has a role to play in that. Yeah, you're, you're really, made, we're making news with that. That's the very, the, the cutting edge of what's going on uh, for sure with catch and release and, and what just the impact uh, in communities across our border. We've seen the mayor of Del Rio last week uh, uh, making a plea to the president of the United States to help uh, these communities that are suffering from just an inundation that, that is only gonna get worse. Um, 
This is, so this is a question for, for all of you. Um, what's the best avenue for stemming the flow of potential terrorists uh, through Latin America towards our border? Well, I guess I could take that. Yeah, go ahead. yeah. Um, I have a chapter, a chapter nine dedicated to that. So there's far more in there than uh, what I can talk about here. But um, there is a uh, far war and a near war uh, the FAR war involves uh, HSI, Homeland Security Investigations, ICE's um, investigative arm for complex investigations uh, that are uh, that is deployed throughout the Americas. They are in multiple countries, uh, ranging all the way down to the uh, to Chile and uh, Brazil and Argentina and Paraguay, and they are there for one. Uh, what not their only purpose, but a primary purpose is to hunt down and arrest special interest alien smugglers. That's what they do. And those are very wily beast. That kind of a smuggler is a very unique kind of smuggler with skill sets. They're, they're sophisticated and cosmopolitan and uh, multilingual and multiple residences in different continents. Uh, and they, they know how to evade. And uh, HSI needs to um, evaluate whether the, the resources and personnel are sufficient to the threat of those smugglers that they pose. Cause you gotta break, you gotta blow the bridges. Those guys provide the bridges over the Atlantic. Uh, they do a great job there. They're catching them all the time. But I think there's a serious question as to whether or not they're being diverted, whether they are being distracted and whether they have what, they're, what they need to take down these Iranian uh, smugglers, for example. Uh, the 11 just showed up at the Arizona border, which shows you that there was a, a smuggling organization that got them from Iran to Arizona. And just three months ago, uh, HSI helped the Brazilians break down a massive 10 year long Iranian smuggling uh, kingpin took them out. So somebody else is still working in there bringing Iranians in obviously. And when you take out a Pakistani smuggler, uh, you still have Pakistanis coming in. And the fact that we still have those migrants able to make the leap over the pond and get here tells me that there may be an issue of resources for uh, HSI on that problem. And now they're gutting ICE enforcement, and they're doing a lot of reorgan. There's a big reorganization coming for ICE, uh, probably within 90 days. And I kind of worry about what's going to happen to the special interest alien smuggling ops down there. Josh, if I, if I may, yeah, uh, Ken, go ahead. The other thing I think that that um, factors into this is our general uh, approach to Latin America and South America. Uh, on a on a foreign policy, intelligence, and, and military basis, you know, early on after 9/11, we were very concerned uh, with what they called the border triangle down there, relatively lawless zone. Uh, you know, had large uh, Lebanese community there with ties to Hezbollah. You know, there are communities down there with, uh, you know, with ties to Sunni Sunni jihadist terrorists. Uh, these are issues that we need intelligence on. We need people on the ground. We need cooperation with, with, uh, with governments that want to help us, which is another issue that uh, we have, means we have to have a policy there that is uh, aimed at the governments. You got a lot of governments down there, Venezuela, Cuba, uh, Bolivia, and certain places that don't want to be helpful, uh, that are in alliance with or have relationships with groups that uh, we've designated as terrorists, like uh, the Iranian IRGC. So if we don't have the relationship down there, we don't have a more comprehensive Latin America policy upon which to base uh, the kind of work that Todd's talking about, uh, then they're really going to be out all, all, all on their own. It's going to make their job a lot harder. So we need to think, we need to rethink some of those issues as well. Yeah, exactly, Josh. So, so what's the best avenue for stemming the flow of potential terrorists through Latin America? You've you've looked at this and been analyzing it as well. Sure, sure. Uh, and this kind of goes to Todd's idea of a far war versus a near war. 
I, I think a great enforcement point uh, for the U.S. government is, is the border between Guatemala and Mexico. And part of the reason for that is that we actually have a, a very good working relationship with law enforcement in, in Guatemala. Uh, DEA, FBI, HSI all, all work in, in Guatemala, in, in Guatemala City, uh, in an embassy there, and, and uh, work very well with, with their counterparts. So we, we can work uh, as, as U.S. law enforcement in Guatemala. Uh, we don't have the best relationship with, with Mexico right now on a law enforcement level, and, and that uh, seems to be getting worse. Uh, but one thing that Mexico has historically done since, at least since 9-11, is work closely with us on, on, on any terrorism. Uh, so I, I, I think that uh, there is the potential there for us to work jointly, uh, trilaterally with, with Mexico, Guatemala. And that border is, is relatively small, there are only a couple of, of roads that 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 go that pass the border, uh, and the roads. It might be a generous description of of, of what those things are. Uh, drug traffickers don't, don't even like to use them because it's hard to it's hard to get through basically uh, that area. So that that would, but obviously the the caravans, the, the the migrants that are coming north towards the United States have to cross there. So that is it's sort of a choke point. Uh, where we, we can move uh, immigration enforcement as opposed to trying to defend it on our border where we have thousands of miles uh, to defend and, and uh, you know, a couple dozen ports of, of entry to, to worry about. Uh, so if, if it were me and I was thinking strategically as, as to how, it, how to address this problem specifically and, and just generally the, the immigration uh, issue with the caravans coming north from Central America, I would focus on that. That uh, that choke point between Guatemala and Mexico, and if I can add, if I can add on to that a little bit, um, so he, sure. he he's absolutely correct. We we have a very good uh, collaborative relationship um, on the terrorism issue, uh, not so much sometimes on the drug trafficking issue, but on the terrorism issue, we do tend to have good collaborative. Uh, the Mexicans. Uh, announced last year, nobody paid attention to this except me probably, that they had apprehended 19 jihadists on their territory and deported all 19 of them. And uh, you can rest assured that that was not a unilateral move on the part of Mexico. That would have been with our guys right there in their detention facilities interrogating and investigating those 19. The same thing goes with Panama, uh, 49 uh, uh, encounters with uh, jihadists in Panama in the last uh, few years. Uh, we are, have a very strong presence, HSI and FBI in the embassy down there that are working on this. That's all part of the far war. Uh, but the bigger issue is that they're not all our friends down there. Uh, we have uh, Venezuela, for example, which is a major transit point for SIA smuggling with uh, Hezbollah and Iranian connections there, uh, direct air flights uh, from Tehran to Caracas. You have Cuba, which is um, hostile. Uh, we're diplomatically estranged despite, uh, I mean, we haven't gotten it to the point where we are collaborative, uh, but uh, Havana is a major SIA uh, transit uh, point. Uh, Bolivia, up until fairly recently, uh, was a, a hostile government that was not collaborating with us, and SIAs knew it. Ecuador. So I guess what I'm saying is that for all the friends we have, we have enemies down there, or at least certainly not countries that are um, interested in our national security like we are. Um, and maybe even, as I say at one point, sadistically would enjoy if a terrorist came through their territory and did something on ours. Uh, it's just something to keep in mind that uh, there are a lot of ways in and around our friends down there where we have HSI and FBI station. Todd, I want to go back to the state level action because I'm looking at some questions from our audience and one of them is, is about the Department of Public Safety involvement currently uh, that you briefly mentioned, but Another question that's related is, can Texas finish the wall in our state? I guess, could we finish the wall in a couple of years, ask for reimbursement when there's perhaps a change in administration again in Washington? Uh, I'm just gonna say that's not really my expertise. I think you'd need a lawyer for that. 
I was uh, last month at the wall in New Mexico at the point where it stopped on the day that it stopped, construction stopped. Uh, so, I mean, I can talk a little bit tactically about the wall and its, its uses, but um, I'm in contact with some of the um, con contractors. There are 12 major contractors. And when their uh, work, when their contracts were sort of suspended like that, uh, they uh, are just uh, in confusion. They don't even know how to respond or react. They could go to court, I guess, or there's going to be negotiations. Maybe they'll be paid off. Uh, they have, the contractors have no idea whether they're going to be able to get their money or, uh, you know, what's going to happen with that. And in the meantime, just as an aside, I'll just say that when I was out there, I noticed that there were acres and acres uh, of 15 foot high stacked wall panels. Uh, there must have been thousands of them out there uh, in, in the, just a couple of the spots that I saw in New Mexico. And I just wonder who's going to pay to move those things or get rid of them or somehow dispatch with them. Nobody's asking that hard question. I mean, you would not believe how much equipment and material is out there in the desert. Yeah, and we're going to, at Texas Public Policy Foundation, we'll be looking at, at these issues of what the state can do, whether it's uh, uh, the, the Carrizo cane problem. I know there's a bill in the Texas House uh, to, to get rid of more of that eradication of the brush that, that makes it difficult to catch. And the, the current administration does say they're still committed to turning back uh, recent border crossers, so we need to facilitate that. Uh, another question is from a, a viewer is, what specific legislation should be introduced on the Hill that will get attention to the issue? Any takers for that? I, I think it's, it's less about specific legislation and more about oversight. I, I think what, what, needs to be happen, what, what needs to happen is, is, is congressmen uh, on, on the committees that, that can address these issues, call in witnesses and, and take a closer look at, at the, the asylum issue a closer look at, at, at the, the, you know, the, the extent of the problem that Ty uh, highlights in, in his book with, with jihadists potentially coming across the border. I, I think oversight is, is, is what Congress can, can do uh, right now that it was most needed. Uh, if, if I can follow up on, on that real quickly, uh, he's, he's absolutely right. The, the, one of the, the um, fail points I identify in the book with the covert border war, the near war and the far war is that there are so many different agencies that are involved in so many different parts of it. And each agency uh, has its own oversight subcommittee that looks at what they do uh, without um, taking into account the, the whole part of the, the covert border war, I don't, if they're even aware of it. And um, one of my recommendations is uh, that you know, this all needs to be brought in what all the agencies are doing. There's the CIA, there's DIA, there's uh, NORTHCOM, there's SOUTHCOM, there's SOC North, there's HSI, there's FBI, there's the Coast Guard has been involved in this, the U.S. Navy has been involved in this, and the NSA have all been involved in the covert border war, and they all have different oversight uh, functions um, or, you know, different committees that, you know, and nobody's looking at it as a whole. And I think that that's very problematic. Uh, there are problems with the near war and the far war. Uh, if I could just get a real quick one in, that part of the near war is that we've got FBI and ICE agents going into the detention facilities to do in-depth face-to-face interviews with uh, a lot of these migrants. But in my experience with DPS, uh, uh, direct experience inside the detention facilities myself with my team, I know for a fact that maybe a third of them are getting the interviews and two thirds of them are not being interviewed at all before they bond out and leave. Uh, I don't think any oversight committee understands that and what the problem is with that. Uh, when I was with DPS, I ordered up a program where my analysts were going down into the facilities to interview the ones that nobody could get to just to help. And it was a drop in the ocean, honestly. Uh, and so, uh, you know, a big recommendation in the book is somebody's got to fix that. We need, we need to have vetting, real vetting for all of them. 
Actually, I'm really glad you mentioned the, the, the bond out and leave. Can you explain that for our audience? What are the current detention capacities and requirements and, and how do people bond out and leave? Well, is that for me? Yeah, yeah. Tom. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, well, so almost all special interest aliens uh, apply for asylum. They, they make a claim. Uh, and by the way, I, as a quick aside, I'm using the term special interest aliens because that's always been government jargon for, that's the lexicon officially in the books for that kind of a migrant uh, for the near war. But uh, I want to say that uh, two weeks ago, the Biden administration came up with a new one called special interest non-citizen, special interest non-citizens. Uh, undocumented non-citizens, whatever that's worth. I, I mean, that maybe could be an indication of, um, again, politicizing this, this issue that should never be politicized. Uh, but the Obama administration did it too. They changed the name from special interest. They hate the name special interest aliens. So they called it uh, third country nationals uh, so that nobody would be offended by that, uh, by that, the use of the term alien or something. But anyway, I digress. The um, most of them will apply for asylum. This is non-COVID era. Uh, so let's just take COVID out of the equation and assume that we're kind of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with that. Uh, and they'll, they'll be detained for a period until they can be either interviewed or processed. Uh, they can make bond. A bond will be set and they'll make their bond and, and be released on their own recognizance and they can qualify at that point for uh, work authorization and a social security card and they get in line and queue. It might be three or four years before they ever see an immigration judge. Uh, and they can you know, uh, drag that out for years if they move somewhere from one jurisdiction to another. And that's typically what happened. And the idea for the near uh, war is to get in there and get them interviewed first. Uh, I remember um, interviewing a, um, an Iranian that got caught. And I talk about this in the book. Uh, I went, I asked, you know, give me the names of all the ones that know that the FBI hasn't gotten to. And I knew that the FBI often, I would say always, not often, always interviewed Iranians and Pakistanians and Syrians and uh, Afghanis especially. But um, Iranians were definitely a big uh, priority for the, and somehow this, this guy had been missed. So I said, well, I'll go interview him. And I interviewed him. And it turns out that he was a member of, he claimed to me that he was a member of the Ayatollah's personal bodyguard for years and years and they got half of them got purged in some kind of a beef uh, and he you know had to flee the country to get away from from you know whatever was going to happen to him uh, and so how an Iranian went for three months without being interviewed uh, is you know egregious I mean that can't be that can't be allowed to happen anymore on the border and it's happening right now I can tell you it's happening um, so we'll, we'll see what happens with the Biden administration on this. But again, this goes back to we need to evaluate the resources that are applied to this issue in the country and down in Latin America. And nobody's doing it. Kyle, were you going to say something about this issue or another? Well, I had a question for Todd, actually, which is on this question of after people bond out, um, some, you know, certain uh, percentages of them simply just don't show up, right, for the next hearing. And so then you have to have a process to have people to go find them. Uh, now, my understanding is that the Biden administration wants to essentially uh, cut down to a nub uh, the, 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 the ICE guys that we actually have go do that, right, who actually have to go find these people and bring them in and wants to transfer them into the investigative side. Right. What is your I mean, what is your take on on what the Biden administration is proposing for ICE and internal enforcement and how we deal with uh, these people that, you know, get a quick asylum question, get a bond and are, are gone? 
it, it, this should frighten every American who learns about it. I don't know if everybody's even learning about it. This is absolutely, uh, you know, a blueprint for disaster and crime and criminality uh, that you're going to reduce to a nubbin, as you said, interior ICE enforcement. Uh, and on the question of uh, terrorism and prospective terrorists, uh, it's especially egregious because there will not be interior, there won't be uh, ICE deportation officers tracking down uh, people who, who do wrong from those countries. Uh, let me just give you a quick, uh, I'm gonna try to make this very quick a case in about 10 years ago, uh, it's been a while, but a Somali and his wife came across and said that they were victims of Al-Shabaab. They came into Texas, uh, went into the Pearsall detention facility uh, she, the, she bonded out immediately and got, uh, was able to uh, get her asylum claim approved within about 10 weeks. And she moved on up to Wisconsin. The only reason he didn't is because there was an FBI informant inside a Somali placed inside the detention facility in Pearsall who sidled up next to the guy and got him to talk all about his deep, uh, involvement and activities with al-Shabaab for years and years, including uh, a plan to uh, commit some kind of an attack inside the United States. Uh, and it was by pure serendipity that they caught him by having an agent informant in the facility. Uh, well, then of course the whole thing unraveled and somebody had to go get her because she was part of the thing. Uh, and if there's nobody to go get her, She's, uh, you know, an Al-Shabaab uh, covered up an involvement with Al-Shabaab and God knows what she was going to do, uh, if anything. And they were both prosecuted, thankfully, for immigration fraud with a terrorism enhancement. Uh, and there are many more cases just like that where uh, within just a hair, they, uh, you know, had gotten asylum, might have gotten asylum. So, um Todd, how about the problem of asylum fraud referrals for prosecution? What, what's happening? Are we seeing referral? There's such massive fraud. Are, are these cases being referred for prosecution? Well, my point of reference for that are uh, successive GAO, GAO investigative reports, Government Accountability Office reports about asylum fraud detection. And so I cite these reports. I analyze these reports out. Uh, which um, in their, it is in their findings that U.S. attorneys' offices, by and large, do not prosecute asylum fraud at all, zero or one or, uh, you know, over the course of years that they looked at. Uh, and that was just the one in 2015. There were also GAO reports from earlier years dating to 20, 2008. There was another one in 2014 that just keep talking about how USCIS uh, does not have a way to any training or uh, inclination or willpower to just uh, bust these guys for asylum. They just, they wave them in. And one of the worst violators of this was uh, Mayorkas, the current secretary of DHS just uh, recently confirmed uh, and in his background and history, he was one of those guys who was about getting to yes uh, for asylum and uh, was um, especially hostile toward anybody who was interested in uh, fraud detection and prosecution. And the number of fraud investigators at USCIS is minuscule compared to the number of uh, complaints and indicators that, of, that fraud has occurred. And people from the Middle East, Pakistan, uh, those, those people show out to be uh, very high committers of uh, asylum fraud. They just don't get prosecuted very often. And I mean, right after 9-11, Todd, you know, immigration fraud was, was pushed to the top of the pile and because we saw, uh, you know, people involved in that plot and, and, and suspected follow-up plots and were, were, were folks that had overstayed or, or otherwise engaged in some element of fraud, um, 
And it's, it was, you know, and a lot of major investigations were built out of what started as an immigration fraud case. So if you don't do that early work, uh, you don't use that immigration fraud or potential fraud as a predicate for an investigation. You don't know what you're not, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you're not finding out because you didn't do the, the initial investigation. And I think that's important for us to, to keep in mind and, and to remind people that, you know, even if you're not that excited about immigration fraud, you don't know that you won't protect it, uh, or prevent the next attack uh, by, by, by tracking down somebody that's, that, that's a visa overstay or has otherwise committed uh, immigration fraud. Right. And uh, SIA smugglers, I have a chapter on SIA smugglers and how they operate. Uh, they depend on our ability. It's integrated into their basic business model that their client is going to get in on an asylum claim. They're going to get coaching and they're going to get into the country because if they don't, these guys are spending thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 for the trip uh, and they end up uh, getting deported. They didn't make credible fear or whatever. Uh, word gets back to the home country that this smuggler is unable to get us in and we wasted $40,000. Don't use him. So it's incumbent on them. They, they, they literally depend on our inability and unwillingness to detect fraud. And the same thing with the Europeans. The, your, the whole thing is set up to facilitate entry and never ever to detect terrorism. Uh, at, there, there's never one case that I've been able to find in Europe or here where USCIS officers were the ones that found the terrorism connection. It's, does it, it's not set up that way. It needs to be reformed. And under this administration, I just can't see that ever happening. Uh, not enough for another four years. Last question that transitions beautifully uh, and it's probably a simple answer. How can we hold officials who do not enforce the law accountable? Of course, voting is one way. Is there any other way? Um, the election, right? And Todd mentioned that. But Todd, I want to uh, basically, you know, thank you for your service to our country and to the state. Excellent book, America's Covert Word of War, highly recommended. Thank you to all of our panelists and audience members and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you.